today with an old friend of mine who is visiting us up from Florida. And Anita, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to the people who are watching who may not uh, remember you. Well, I'm Anita Rubenstein Silverman. I think most of the people knew me as Anita Rubenstein. I started working in Southeast Elementary in the speech department for Irv Maston. Stayed in the speech department with Irv for five years approximately and transferred to the high school, the Sonderling Guidance, where I, f I found that I loved it. I loved the speech department, but not like the high school. The high school was the thing. And I made wonderful friends in the high school, loved my job, and, uh, and stayed there until I retired in 1990. Now, you're in Boca now, is that right? I live in Boca Raton. When I remarried, I lost my husband in 1985, and I remarried someone from Brentwood, Bob Silverman, in 1987. And on a lark, on a vacation in Florida, we put, I think, $10 down on a condo with the intention of renting it out and probably never living there and making some money. Bob was in the office furniture business, and he went out of business in 1989. And then he stayed home, and I worked. And after one year of doing that, I said, no way. And I retired. And we went to the condo that had been rented out. We told the people, please vacate. They did. And that's where I live, with many people from Brentwood in this condo, many people. Some people worked in the school district, some did not. Uh, but I see a lot of them down, down in Boca, many people. Del Rey, Harriet Cooper. I don't know if anyone remembers Harriet. She worked, I think, in East, I think East Junior High in Guidance. And she's in Del Rey Beach. Yvette Zimmerman is in Boca, where I live. Uh, I, I just can't remember offhand. Uh, Miriam, Miriam Friedman lives about two blocks from me. <sighs> Lillian. Lillian Yedwabnik lives on my street. Jeez. We're about four houses away. <laughs> and we're good friends. We always That's have wonderful. been. Oh, we are a contingent of Brentwood. We, we really... Do you have meetings down there uh, of, the, of the contingent? No, we really don't. Mm -hmm. But we see each other. We see okay. each other at different functions and uh, it's really great. We we have a great time. And Marilyn De Plaza, oh, yes. who worked, I think, in the Ross Sondola, in Ross High School, uh, and I found each other in Boca, and she and I ran reunions, uh, usually in the beginning about three times a year, and then it it became twice a year, and then it became once a year, and then it became almost nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And now, last year we had one, and if need be, we will do it again. She really does most of the work. She's a terrific gal. Now, your husband, as I, we were talking a few moments ago, your, your husband is a very talented guy. Yeah. And has also, uh, he's also developed a skill. I guess he's always had it, but certainly he's in the an last artist. Few years. He, he's really an artist. He, uh, he carves. He's a wood carver, uh -huh. and he's made some magnificent pictures. He sculpts, he's, they're all over my house. In fact, it's moving out, us out of the house because we have no room for it anymore. But he is terrific. He has sold some of his pieces and he's still doing it. As I speak, he is probably doing yes. it now. Talk about family. Talk, tell us about, uh, about the, the... Well, I have three children. Mm -hmm. Son, David, now lives in California. Uh, he was a product of the Brentwood schools. He did very uh, works for Harmon Cardin, just came back from China where they sent him to test some equipment. Uh, my second son, Steve, is a product of the Brentwood uh, schools. He's, uh, he graduated college as a teacher, taught for a while. Some, he did have a job in Brentwood, but he went into the construction business where he made more money. And he's still in construction. He lives in Marietta, Georgia. My daughter, Sue, 
is a product of the Brentwood School. She attended Maslow Tafla and loved it and did very well. She now works for Glen Cove Schools as their media consultant. Uh, all in all, I'm very proud of my children. They gave me seven grandchildren. And now the grandchildren are going to watch this someday. So someday. you want to say something? To well, each my one. my eldest granddaughter Felicia, she's she's 17. She's coming to visit me for Christmas. She's gorgeous. She's tall and thin and beautiful, and she's wonderful. And the next one in line is Alex from Long Island. He's 15, and he he does exceptionally well in school. Of course, they all do. Ariel is his sister. She's next. She's 14. And they're my daughter's children. And my son in Marietta, Georgia, has four sons. And they range in age from 10 to 6. She had one a year. And they're also wonderful kids. One of them, who's now 8, is taking piano lessons. And I think he gets that from me, I hope. <laughs> and uh, they're all really good. Michael, Daniel, Eric, and Elliot, and they're all really wonderful kids. I see them probably twice a year because it's difficult. They're so far away. California, I usually wait to get a uh, ticket that's free from the airlines, right. and right. then I see right. them in California. And this, my daughter Sue, I see often because I get on a plane and I come up here and I stay with them for a while. So... Uh, you, you see family traits and talents showing up in the oh, grandchildren, yes. do you? Oh, yes. My eldest son is a genius in electronics. That's from his father, mm -hmm. who was doing the same thing. Uh, my second son, although I thought he would be a teacher, he he's in construction. And my husband also could fix and build and do anything uh -huh. with his hands. And that's yeah. my Wonderful. that's my second son. He takes after yeah. his that's they both take after that's their that's father that. in different ways. But the music is there too, as you said. Oh yeah. The music is there because I have been playing piano since I'm eight years old. Uh -huh. I played many times for the Christmas pageants in the elementary school when they found out that I played and I, I did do that and I loved it. Yeah. And I I played, I don't know if anybody would remember this, there was a counselor in the high school that I worked for. Her name was Helen Smith. I loved her. And she, was a, she had a great influence on me. She taught me so many things that, that are invaluable. And when she passed away, they were looking for someone to play Chopin. And I said, I play Chopin. And I practiced and practiced and practiced for that night, and I played. And I'll never forget it. Never. That's, that's lovely. I'll that's never a, forget Helen. Yeah. Helen was a, a really great woman that she shouldn't be forgotten. Now, you retired in, in 1990? 1990. 1990. June of 1990. Okay. And I moved to Boca, where they found out that I played the piano. Okay. And, yes. uh, now I uh, right now I I am the pa pianist for our cho chorus. We have a big chorus in the condo that I live in, and I play for them. We meet once a week, and then we appear in different places. Anybody who'll have us, we we go to. We usually get paid, not much, but mm -hmm. we do get paid. Mm -hmm. And we go to any nursing home, hospital, school, organization, anybody, and we're wanted because we're pretty good mm -hmm. and. Uh, and we, we love it. All of us love it. I was going to say, you're having fun doing that, obviously. I love it, yeah. yeah. I used to sing with the chorus. I would much rather do that. But we don't have anyone to play the piano. I mean, the man who used to play got very old, and he couldn't do it anymore. So I left the singing part, and I do the playing. This this occupies a great deal of your time, does it? Well, I have to do a lot of rehearsal. Uh -huh. Yeah, it occupies a great deal of my time. And then something new came into my life. Uh, some woman moved into our place who is a professional singer. And she's losing the girl that accompanies her. Uh -huh. So she has made a proposal to me. Would I become her accompanist? And I said, maybe, if I, if I can, if I can find the time, because it requires 
unbelievable amount of rehearsal. But I, I am going to try it. And uh, no, she's a performer. She's a performer, paid performer. Her husband is too. They are now organizing a show in our condo, <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I'm going to be the musical part Wonderful. of it. So uh, it, my life has become so busy. This, I don't know how I ever worked. Yeah, the, the, well, I've heard that before. This sounds like a whole a whole new life. I mean, yeah. you've taken on a, yeah. a new life. It's, Why did you retire in '90? What was the thing that prompted you to leave? Well, I worked in the records department in the Sonderling High School, and the job was getting out of hand, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. They needed more help in this field, and it was just too difficult for me to do it. I did it, and I struggled, and I kept asking for help, but I never got it. And I retired because my husband retired the year before because he closed his business. And for one year, he sat home building ship models while I had to be at work at 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and I came home exhausted, angry at everything that happened in school. And at one year of that, I said, enough. That's it. I'm leaving. I'm retiring. And we're moving to Florida. And we did. And it was the best thing we did. How many years were you at? Uh, Twen I, I was in Brentwood for 25 years uh -huh. from the start. When I started, I believe it was the end of a 1960, 1965 to 1990 would be 25 years. Where did you work in 1965? In the Southeast Elementary School okay. in the Handicapped Wing. Uh -huh. The speech department was located in the back of the school where uh, they had the mentally, uh, the emotionally disturbed, the physically handicapped. Uh, I don't know, Carl Smith was one of the teachers. Fran Foreman was one of the teachers. Sandy Chase was one of the teachers. And we have, we have stories with Fran Foreman that are really funny. There was a time that we had a piano in the back and the piano belonged to special ed. But our principal, uh, I can't even remember his name, uh, he thought the piano belonged to the school. Fran Foreman got wind of this, that he was taking it away. She had the special ed truck pull up, remove the piano in, in about 10 minutes. The piano was gone. And he walked up to look for the piano. It was gone. <laughs> And that was the end of the piano. We lost it, but he didn't get it. Oh, and that's, that, and that's, that's the way it was. Now, Sandy Chase, you said? Sandy so, Chase. So you worked with her even? Well, I didn't work with her. I worked with Herb Maston in the speech department. Okay. She was around the corner teaching uh, yes. physically. But what I meant again. is that you had a, a friendship with her oh, that, yeah. goes, that went way back. Way right? back. And it went into the high school. When she came to the high school, she was a great friend. She was a lovely person, a wonderful teacher, and uh, we were good friends. Why did you come to Brentwood, uh, Anita, in 1965? What brought you to Brentwood, Long Island? To the, to, to the school district? To, well, what brought you to oh, live I, there first and then to... I moved then... to Brentwood in 1954. Oh, so you were before... The schools oh, in those years were in uh, churches... I think in storefronts, there, there yes. was, the only school that existed, as I remember, was Village. Village was the school. There was no high school. Right. Uh, and right. then we moved to Brentwood because we lived in Brooklyn. And we, my husband worked on the island, and we needed a house. And we heard of a development called Robin Hill. Mm -hmm. we, moved, we rode out there and, in, I think, in the space of 10 minutes, bought a house. And uh, we moved, and we loved it. We loved it. I made friends that are still my friends. I lived on Timberline. In 1965, no, uh, no, 1956, they opened up Southeast School. And my son was in the first class. My oldest son, David, was in the first class in Southeast School. Well, then you were in Brentwood when it was growing at oh, an yeah. unprecedented rate. I mean, this was post-war Unbelievable. Years. Unbelievable. I think we added a school maybe every two years Amazing. until there were, there were 14 elementaries, four junior highs, and the two high schools. And then, and my children 
just went to all of the schools. Yeah. And my son went to, well, they went to many schools in the district because they were, we moved. We moved from Timberline up to Ellery Street in North Brentwood. So they eventually went to North Junior High. And he went to South Junior High, the oldest one. And then they both went, they all went to the Sondalin. Well, you were home with them for from the time that... Uh, I moved in 54. 54, right. And I was home until 1965 when I decided I better get out there and do something with my brain. Uh -huh. And I needed the money. Uh -huh. And uh, in those years, it was also very different. Uh, all I did was went into Bayshore passed the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building, heard they were giving a test, walked in off the street, took the test, <laughs> and passed it. And then I got a call from the school. In one day, I had five interviews. Was this, was this a, uh, the test, was this a district test? Was it a civil service it test? It was a civil service test. Mm -hmm. And uh, there weren't that many schools yet out in Suffolk County. I heard from the police department, I heard from another school district, but Brentwood was what I wanted. And then in one day, I had five interviews, and uh, one of them was Irv Maston, and I got that job, stayed there for five and a half years, and then transferred to the high school, where I, I felt I belonged. That was where I belonged. Met wonderful people there. I was there at the start of Maslow Tafla. I remember John when he came in, I never even knew John. He, you right. came in with Bob Leiterman. That's right. And, he, and they asked me to type something for this cockamamie school. Yes. <laughs> and I did. And I ended up with a daughter going there and very involved with it. Before we talk about that, I want to go back to the interview. Do you remember any, does anything about that interview with Irv Masson stand out? <laughs> oh, yeah. What? Tell me about it. Uh, we talked about nothing, nothing about a job. Of where do you live? Oh, you have nice legs. <laughs> Things like that. And before I knew it, I had the job. Oh, yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> Not at all the way it goes today. No, no. 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 And that's no. how he interviewed most of his speech teachers. Most of them had nice legs. I guess they all had to, to get the job. You mentioned going down to Bayshore for the interview. Most of the, the commercial uh, activity in Brentwood in those days was in Bayshore, too, wasn't it? There was very little in Brentwood. Oh, the, yeah, uh, we had nothing in Brentwood. We didn't even have, well, we had a supermarket that was a tiny grocery store. I think it was called Fishes, if I'm not mistaken, and Colas, two of them, Fishes yes. and Colas. Uh -huh. That was it. There was no other place to buy milk. And eventually, an AMP came in uh, on Suffolk Avenue. There was nothing. We did our shopping in Smithtown or Bayshore. It must have been wonderful when it snowed in those days, too, to get to uh, wherever you had to go with the uh, with Well, the it was very difficult, yeah. really difficult. There were times that when it snowed, we had to be dug out of our house. Yes, sure. We, for, I think it was four days, but it was fine. We had a fireplace and we made our own heat and we had a ball. What are some of the memories that stand out, Anita, of, of Brentwood in those early days of you having lived there? We're talking now mid-50s, uh, 54, 55. Well, it was a different community. I, I don't know what it is today. I haven't been back. Right. But in those years, you could go to sleep with your door open. We never even locked the door. Yeah. And our neighbors were our, they were our family. To this day, we are still family. Uh, it was a, it was a wonderful time. Uh, when I went in to visit my family in Brooklyn, I couldn't wait to get back to Brentwood yeah. because I knew there was some kind of a game going on with the kids either playing baseball in the street or something was going on. And even the kids couldn't wait to get back to their house in Brentwood. We had a pool in the back and it was a fantastic time. Brentwood 1950s was very much America 1950s. There was almost a, a a uh, happy days kind of. It was, it, it was, it was. The men went to work, they came home, we gathered together, we had coffee. It was, and the kids were, were great friends. I have to tell you, there was a, my son Steve was very active in sports, and this was about when he was probably about 12. He came home and he told me he's having a baseball game in the backyard. And Gary, his friend, is coming. He's never been here before. So when Gary rings the bell, tell him to go into the backyard. 
And a, 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 eventually someone rang the bell and a boy came to the door and he said, Gary. Gary was black and there weren't that many black kids in the neighborhood then. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, you're Gary? They're in the backyard. Go ahead. That night, I asked my son, Steve, I says, why didn't you tell me that Gary was black? He says, he's what? I says, he's black. He says, I didn't know. Uh -huh. And I was surprised at the answer. Yeah, I'll say. In those, <clears throat> back at that particular time, uh, most of the black people in Brentwood were living in a development called Regis Park, as I recall, That's too. That's correct, yeah. A, a few black families moved into Charter Oaks, which was not too far from us. And my son and all, in fact, all of my children started meeting children from the other developments. And the, the, uh, there was never to my remembrance, any problems. They got along, they called each other names, and they laughed. Yes. And it was yes. all done in really good spirit, especially the Steve, who was in sports. He, he says he doesn't even see the difference. I think we've seen wonderful things happen throughout the years that, that you and I have spent there with, uh, with regard to race. It's been a microcosm of, of the country, of the way we wanted the country to become, I think. Small town, but... Uh, many aspects of the inner city too. Yeah, also. oh yeah. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago, you started to mention that time when I walked in with Bob Lightman <laughs> and, uh, and you first learned about that cockamamie school over there. Uh, you became, you be, you, I recall at first, you were very skeptical and then you became- I was. Uh, uh, you became very, very committed after a while to the concept. To the idea. Yeah, I was. I thought it was a great idea. I know my daughter, who was a very good student all of her life, did better when she went to Maslow. She, she just, she blended in wonderfully. She loved it. She understood the concept and she did very well by it. In the beginning, I was reluctant, and then I learned that it was very good for the, her and all of the other students. They were, it was wonderful. I remember the graduation. I was reluctant. I said, you're having your own graduation? I couldn't believe it. And we went, and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful graduation. It was very different from the big school graduation, but it was great. It was really great. There was also a political aspect to that, unfortunately. I mean, the, the, you know, you would like to keep the politics out of education, but unfortunately, you are fortunately, politics is a part of our life no matter where we are. Were you actively, uh, were you active politically no. throughout your... your uh, no, I was not. Service in Brentwood, you no. were? No, okay. I wasn't. I didn't, I, see, I didn't remember whether you ran for office or you became active in your... Well, I was active somewhat in our uh, union, mm -hmm. and we were sort of beaten down by the administration, and then I just, I just got out of Lost it. Lost interest. We, huh? we had a strike. We pulled a strike where all of the clericals dressed in black, and we paraded around the administration building to push, to push our point. We wanted yes. a raise. Yes. And uh, it, it, we did get the raise. I don't know if the strike did it, but the administration was very angry with most of us. They withheld our pay, and. Uh, they really, were, they shouldn't have, I think legally they were wrong, but there was nowhere we could go. Nobody wanted to hear us. And eventually they did release our money, our salary. And that's when I sort of backed down. I felt it wasn't worth it to me. I was very upset and I couldn't deal with that. And Anita, do you remember um, when you first went to work in Brentwood, which was you say around 1965, do you remember what it was that you were paid when you first started to work? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it was $52 a week. Yeah. It was, a hundred, I guess, $104 every two weeks is what we got. And I don't think there was any kind of a union at that point. I'm not sure. I don't, re I don't really remember. And eventually, we did get, we were part of CSEA. Then we petitioned to leave CSEA, which was very difficult, and I was part of that group. Mm -hmm. We did leave it eventually. We became part of the BTA, and then we were pretty good at that point. We, we, we did get our raises, and everything changed. But the early years were very bad 
for us. We had very few benefits, and uh, we all felt that they took a lot of advantage of us. You, see, you, you were a little bit ahead of your time, too. I think you were, because I always saw you from the moment I met you as a very assertive person. And women who are assertive, even today, in many areas of our culture, have a rougher time, uh, particularly if it's in a uh, if it's in an area of the economy that has a heavy male uh, <laughs> domination. The funny it. part that you say it was assertive, I never, I never thought I was assertive. Uh -huh. Never. It's just that I was a fighter, and I, <laughs> I fought for what I thought was yes. right. Yes. Until I felt beaten down, yeah. I really did at some point, yeah. and then I just relaxed. What do you miss most about the time that you were in Brentwood? I miss the camaraderie yeah. of the people I knew. I miss what I did. I had a lot to do with the transcripts of all the students going to college, uh, graduating and going to other colleges. And I loved doing that. I loved being part of that. I remember a, a sailor, if I'm not mistaken, came up needing his transcript and he brought me a box of candy. I couldn't believe it. You know, and I, I said, why did you do that? And he says, well, he did it. Uh, he felt that he, it was necessary to sort of pay me back as you didn't have to do that. But uh, I, I loved my job. Most of the years I did. The last few years, everything changed. Uh, I worked for... Now you're going to start telling us about the parts that you don't miss, right? No, no? I, I truthfully <laughs> miss it all. Okay. I really do. I worked for Jim Varian, uh -huh. who was great. And then Jerry Cohn took over, and I really had some really good years with Jerry. And then Marty Efron became mm -hmm. the records officer for the district. And he, I think, was records officer for about two years when I finally retired. Had nothing to do with my retiring. It's just that my personal life was changing, yes. and I needed, I just needed to do that. I don't want to ask. Uh, I don't want to ask you what year you were born. I don't want to put you oh, in that I'm not, position. I have no problems about that. Well, I was okay. born March 5th, 1930. And where was that? Where I was born? born in a little hospital in Brooklyn. But Brooklyn, New York, I think was very different then than what it is now. It was a small, there were farms. We lived near a farm, my mother told me. And Do I recall Bensonhurst? Bensonhurst. Okay. Yeah. I was born in Bensonhurst. The funny part of it is my husband now was born in Benson. He mm. was born in Bensonhurst. He lived near me. We did not know each other. He moved to Brownwood. We did not know each other. And I met him uh, I met him in 1986. And we were kids from the same neighborhood who grew up. We went to the same high school, walked the same halls at the well, same time. Well, you and time. I went to the same high New school. New Utrecht, yeah. yeah. New Utrecht mm. High School. And then I eventually married Bob. Yeah. And um, that's my background. What about mom and dad? Tell me about your mother and father. What kind of, what, what were they like? My uh, father. What, what gifts, what talents did they, did they have? <laughs> I don't think any. <laughs> <laughs> my father was English and he came over with his family to Canada because they couldn't get into this country. Mm -hmm. And from Canada, they came down illegally. He, he remained a British subject until the war broke out in this country. And then his family insisted that he become a, a citizen. I can, I understand, claim British citizenship because I was born of a British uh, national. My mother was born in, um, I can't even pronounce it, a town in Russia. Came here as a young child. She had a family of 11 siblings and her. Mm. And uh, they're all gone. They, the 12 sisters and brothers are all gone. but. We are, uh, we have a big network of cousins, and uh, we're very close. Most of us are very, very close. Did Did your mother's entire family come to this country? You say the she entire was family came to okay. this country. Uh -huh. We think they had money because in uh -huh. those years, most of the people did not come intact. They yes. did. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, but we we were the. Uh, <laughs> The rule was that you came here poor and you became rich. My family came here rich and became poor. <laughs> but uh, not of all of us are poor now, and we've survived. And um, my mother did not have any talent that I knew. She was just a hardworking housewife and mother. 
My father worked. My father was a model. That was his only claim to fame. Uh -huh. He was a model for Walter Thornton agencies. He modeled in the years of the late 40s into the early 50s. He was on billboards and wow. magazines. and oh. Yeah, he, he was pretty good. Most people recognized him from his modeling days. Was it clothing? Men's clothing, was it? At anything... Yeah, it was men's clothing. It was Philco air conditioners in those years. Oh, he, was I see. On, he was on the billboards. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, he he was theatrically inclined. How how many brothers and sisters did, did you have? I had one brother who passed away in 1979. He was fifty two. Oh my! And he lived in Florida. We were extremely close, and he owned a pawn shop and loved it. He had a garage sale every day. <laughs> what are some of the earliest things, the earliest memories you have of growing up in here? Oh, well, I lived near the water. How, how old were you, by the way, at the earliest memories that you can you figure? Two years you old. You were about two years old. Okay. Well, I remember, no, I must have been younger. I remember being in a crib and I remember, it must have been one of my uncles, I had many uncles, and he must have been trying to make me laugh, and I remember my mother saying, because I wouldn't laugh, She, I remember her saying, uh, well, she doesn't like men. Of course, that didn't last. When I was 14, <laughs> I changed my mind. <laughs> you mentioned something about the water. I lived, we always lived near the water. This is uh, in Bensonhurst In Bensonhurst, now. near uh, Gravesend Bay. Uh-huh. And in those years, there weren't that many homes right, near the right. bay. It was bay. It was really beautiful. And that's where I grew up. Was the Bell, Bell Parkway? Bell wasn't Parkway there. wasn't there. No. I remember when the Bell Parkway went in. My brother was a Boy Scout, and they used to hold their meetings, uh, campfires, all the way out on the, I guess they were dunes or something, before they built the belt. And then the belt came in. I remember the belt coming in. Wow. That's wonderful. We, were, we yeah. would be able to walk to the water. In fact, we went swimming there. It was a beach. It wasn't a pretty beach. It was a pretty dirty beach, but we didn't know it. We had a ball. We went swimming. Well, there. you can remember all the ocean liners coming in then, the Narrows uh, yeah, to New York. Yeah, and I that, do. That I, do. Era of the 40s I, love, and 50s. I have loved the water yeah. since then. Yes. I live on water now. We live on a yes. lake. And uh, I think most of us in my family, we've all lived near the water. We love it. We all Besides the 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 parents, obviously, who uh, you loved, were there other adults that you had an attachment with, or an adult, uh, an older adult that you? Oh yeah, my mother's with? sisters were very uh, very good to us because I didn't have grandparents, and because the grandparents had died, and uh, my mother's sisters, she had, they were five girls and seven boys, and the the uh, four sisters of my mother were my aunts. And we were very close. They were always in my house. Uh, we just were. And yeah. they were like, almost, they were young, but they were like my grandparents. What was the, what was the, uh, the first school that you attended? It was a public school, wasn't it? <laughs> it was PS 128. Uh -huh. And it was, compared to the schools we have now, it's, when I think back, they were, it was, I think, a wooden school. I remember wood. Mm. I remember walls that were all wood. Mm. And teachers that were old, they may not have been, but to me they were old. Yes. And I remember I was in first grade where I began to read. I loved to read. I was a great student. And I still remember uh, how they taught us. We, we didn't get books un until some time passed by. We read... They were gigantic pages that held that were held down from somewhere on the ceiling, and everybody read the same page, and that's how we learned to read. Wow. That's wow. right. Do you remember any of the teachers in those from from those? Years? Oh yeah, I remember. I have a I have a great memory from years ago. Yeah. Don't ask me what I did yesterday. <laughs> I remember most of my teachers, Do you? and I remember the the war. I I was in seventh grade when. Uh, we went to war. I had skipped a, either a year or two. I can't remember, but I was I was young. I shouldn't have been 11 in seventh grade, but I was. And I was 11 when war broke out. And I was in the seventh grade. My teacher's name was Mrs. Peckis. And uh, it was it was 1941. 
And I remember Rose, President Roosevelt's speech. I was in that classroom of seventh grade. I also remember that... When, when you're saying you, you heard the speech on the radio in the classroom? Yeah, they brought the radio in, uh -huh. which was an odd thing. You they, bet. They never did that, but they right. did that day. And I don't think we realized, as we listened to it, what it meant. Mm -hmm. Because we were most... I was 11, and I didn't understand what going to war meant. But on the same vein, about probably around six months later, I was asked to, I played piano then, and I played for many organizations, and there was a uh, radio station somewhere in Brooklyn that my piano teacher had an affiliation with, and she arranged to have me play on the station. And my brother took me by train to the station, and we, being kids, after the, after the radio program was over, we were kids. I was 11, and, and he was about 14. We went into downtown Brooklyn. We bought ourselves a hot dog. We didn't come right home. Yes. And when we came home, my mother was hysterical because that day there were, uh, I don't know if they were rumors or if it really happened, they were U-boats in the harbor uh, of where we lived. And uh, she was desperate. She didn't know what happened to us because we had just taken our time. And uh, she was terrified that something had happened because uh, the fact that a U-boat was in the harbor, everybody was like petrified. Scared. At, at the same time, even though uh, that was at a time when a, when a kid could get on a subway and travel throughout the entire oh, city, yeah. there was no... It, it cost a nickel, Yes. and we went anywhere we wanted, right. all over the city. We could do it all day and all night. And Coney Island was and close safely. to where you are, too. Coney Island, we walked to. You we walked, walked to. We followed the shore going uh -huh. to Coney Island. Wow. And we and we did it pretty often. We did it, and it was safe. Parents didn't worry about us. We there was no reason to. There was a junior high that you probably went to also. I went to junior high one twenty eight. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was the same school. It was okay. It just yes never ended. <laughs> what were the at, uh, what were the best or worst subjects that you had? What what jumps out from memory? Well, the best subjects that I've had was was music. I always mm. excelled in music. My worst probably was history. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And I loved history, but I just didn't do well in the classroom. And I understand now you're involved in, in with a family history. You do. Oh yeah, family. my cousin is uh, just finishing family history, which has taken her a few years to do. And it, it's it, they relied <clears throat> a lot on my memory because I remembered a lot from my childhood, where different people were buried and all kinds of things like that, and she has finished it. In fact, today we're going to get the final draft of draft it. Draft well, of it. Uh, I'm wonderful. excited about that. Have you maintained contact, uh, Anita, with, or did you maintain contact with any of your teachers or any of the people that you went to school with back in elementary school or high school? Uh, no, I never maintained, I never had contact. I didn't have contact with okay. the teachers. I really didn't, yeah. because number one was when I got when I graduated from high school, soon after I got married, and started having my family, and I really probably just never had time sure. or the inclination for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that many of us went to the same schools and didn't know one another. That, no. that we've learned later on. That's right. A lot of us went to, quite a few went to New Church High School, but yes. probably at different times. Yeah. And I remember the principal was Leo Ryan who I thought was an old man, uh -huh. and he wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, That's right. Well, it's, the perspective of youth is, is a little bit different uh, oh, yeah. you know, when, you, when you try to, where age is concerned. Uh, at the time that, that you retired in 1990, um, a lot of things about schools had changed, of course, since the time that you were in school. Um, but there were... There were, I, I, well, how am I trying to, what am I trying to say here? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that somehow or other, parental involvement was always important when kids are growing up. Were your parents involved with school when you were in school, when you were a student? My parents, truthfully, were not as involved as I was. I think they didn't have the they time. They didn't have the time. I think my father was never home. He had a job during the day as a salesman, and in between his selling, he was a model. 
he was almost never home. And my mother was so busy, she had a large family that she took care of, partly, and her two children. And she really wasn't that involved. They were involved, but not as we were. And the children. reason that I'm asking the question, I think your answer is so important for people to hear is that sometimes teachers will complain that parents are not as involved as they should be with their students. Part of the reason for that is exactly what you just said was true for your parents. And I think we're seeing another generation of parents who are in exactly the same place that our parents were back in the That's 40s. Right. There wasn't, there isn't time. They're both working and uh, they're, com they're committed to their kids, but there just isn't time. Well, my brother and I knew that we better, we had better do well with the involvement or without the involvement. We just knew it. And we did do very well. My kids had the involvement. I think they did better than we do. Yes. But uh, now it's changing again because the parents are both working. There is no time. Uh, families are not the same as they were back then. I wanted to ask if there's anything that uh, that you thought we were going to talk about that we didn't talk about, or if there's something that should be mentioned that hasn't been mentioned um, that that we want to get into this interview before we conclude. Oh, I, I, I think, I don't know. I feel that I've said everything I could think of, except that uh, if you're coming down to Boca, come to our reunion if we have it, yes. because it's a ball. We really have a good time seeing each other. I saw it last year I had seen uh, two of the girls that I worked with and lost track of. And I was overwhelmed when I met um, Ruth Gleason and Betty Cascom, who Betty lives in Boca and Ruth lives in Lake Worth now. But we were very good friends and we lost track of each other. And I was surprised. It was really great. I want to ask a couple of things before I conclude. Uh, I'd like to leave this on a laugh if we could. But uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful in, in saying in asking the question, but did you work, uh, you were at the high school when Mr. Weaver was principal no. at the high school. You were not Oh, there. I knew him, but he wasn't principal. It was Stan Yankowski okay. who was there when I got in. But Mr. Weaver, he had some involvement. I don't really remember what. Adult ed, probably, evening school. More probably, likely. right. And I knew him. Right. And I didn't like him because okay. <laughs> I thought he was crazy. Oh. Well, you work with Stan, as I did for a lot of years. What's, what is a, uh, what's one of the most humorous memories that you can attach to those years? To Stan? Because he was oh, very, I, very upstanding, very straight Vermont, uh, well, uh, New if, Englander. Well, if a kid uh, ran away uh, out of the school, Stan was hopping the fences right after them. <laughs> I remember that. He, he didn't think twice about it. He was out, yes. and he dragged them back. Uh, I don't really remember too many things about Stan. I, I do remember something about Mr. Weaver. Yes. I worked for, in the guidance office, I worked for Hal Sabatko at the time. I was his secretary, and I got a call on the telephone from someone named Mr. Weaver, Fred Weaver. I didn't know who Fred Weaver was at the time. And he, on the phone, said, I know who you are. I'm going to tell. I'm going to call Stan Yankowski. I'm going to tell him all about you, what you've done, all the bad things. And I said, I think you have the wrong person. I don't, you don't even know me. And he said, I know who you are. I called Stan Yankowski, and I was hysterical. I said, who is this man? He says, oh, you're talking about Fred Weaver? He says, forget it. It doesn't matter. He's crazy. Oh, Jesus. Oh, gosh. And that's... That's that's beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Anita. It's been a pleasure being with you, and thank you for being uh, good enough to give us this time. Oh, you're very welcome. I really enjoyed it.